uh, you know how yesterday I promised you guys that I had a really gross thing I thought of, but I was going to say. I have been, yeah, I have honestly been waiting for this. Very excited. Okay, so imagine, you know, there's a girl you like, and uh, instead of, like, DMing her, like, hey, or, like, even a picture of your dick, you DM her the sweat outline of your dick on your bed sheets. <laughs> That's one sweaty dick. <laughs> it just yeah, and you do it in the world like your dark ass bedroom that you put blackout blinds in, but with the flash on. So you just see like a salty crust of sweat on your bed. They're calling it the gray duvet cover challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so sort of like a a shroud of Turin, but for your dick. Exactly, yeah, exactly. But using um photo techniques of a certain certain individual, a certain conservative thinker. A certain One sweaty individual. A sweaty conservative individual. <laughs> Shroud of urine? Is that anything? <laughs> yeah. Ah, nice. But yeah, that was the gross thing I was thinking of, and I wanted to wait to tell you guys. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, well, for today's episode, we watched the Mayor Pete documentary, and my Woo! soul my soul has fully left my body. So, in light of that, I'd like to plug something at the beginning of the show. December 8th, Buffalo, Asbury Hall. Tickets still available. If you live in western New York, there is absolutely no reason for you not to attend this concert. If you live anywhere in Canada, the, the entire country of Canada... This is your opportunity to see Chapo. Buffalo is next to the city and state of Canada. If you are a New Yorker who failed to get a ticket to our Brooklyn show, get on the goddamn uh, uh, Amtrak North. Go up there. Do it. I'll go one further. If you're a New Yorker and you either didn't get a ticket to our Brooklyn show or you just like, hey, it's not working for you. Okay. You came here four or five years ago. You were like, I had this idea that I'm going to have a show where it's me and my friends talking about the news. It hasn't worked. <laughs> it's not going well. You've tried everything else. What if you became, you know, like a cardboard box factory foreman in Buffalo? There's Move to Buffalo. There's a lot a of opportunity there. there. You know, if you yes. just if you just want a vibe, if you're done with striving and want a vibe, come to Buffalo. Stay. Just break into the, that uh, candy factory or whatever the fuck they got up there. No, I know. Look, I know nobody wants to work anymore. No, but nobody wants nobody to, wants to work, work anymore. Nobody wants to work anymore. But if you have work ethic, they they have a- excellent job with good benefits going over the Niagara Falls in a barrel. <laughs> you can do that. You can do that every day for a when there's a pension involved in it as well. If so, you I mean, saw, if you're, if you're one of the few people in this country who wants to work, I recommend barrel over absolutely. waterfall. That's that's a growth business. Our, our friend Keith Buckley. Um, We've often called him the Saddam Hussein of Buffalo in a positive way. <laughs> yes, of course. But similar to Saddam Hussein, he needs three dozen body doubles in food pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't knowing be seen our in fans, public. Are you knowing kidding our me? fans, I think, I think you could body double Keith Buckley pretty well. Just start growing your hair and beard true. now. Uh, if you watched uh, uh, the second season of I Think You Should Leave and thought uh, tables sounds like a good job, <laughs> the Buffalo <laughs> Bill uh, 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 tailgate. Is renowned oh, for right. putting people through tables. You could be the table plug. Buffalo is the number one location for people who are injured doing wrestling stunts just to <laughs> impress them and their friends. <laughs> they didn't even remember to record it. Um, if you think this is, I really think, I really think, like if it's just, hey, look, you know, we've been saying it for years. Um, we've lived in this city, New York City, for the longest time, but it's over. It's finished. Everyone's going home. You know, everyone, everyone's leaving instead of going back to Shaker Heights or wherever you guys are from or stay a while. Why I, not? Buffalo? I have to say not Buffalo. I've been thinking about Buffalo, but I'm very excited to go. You guys have been. I have not been before, but I strongly suspect that it has basically the same sort of Great Lakes third coast culture that Felix and I grew up with. It does. Yeah, it absolutely. Matt, I feel completely at home there. Yeah. I like. You know how much I'm like ambivalent to like hating football, like and almost like into hating football. Yeah, 
I stayed in a sports bar for like five hours watching the bull, the Bills make the playoffs last time, and I like had a great time. Yeah. It just feels like right. Yeah, yeah. It's good. I have a feeling it's going to give me a strong Milwaukee vibes. I'm very excited. Yeah, we're going to steal some headphones and get some headphones stolen from us. <laughs> Let's go. We're keeping the headphones economy going by moving headphones from one source to the other. I mean, it's, it's, look, it, we're, we still want to work. Absolutely. We're, we're on we're yes, people set. Still, still willing to work. And um, to that end, this is just how how much we love working. Uh, we, we did just watch the Pete Buttigieg documentary oh, yeah. on Mayor Pete. Mm. Ooh. Uh, it just, I think all of us just, Felix, you said like when you watched it last night, you had to just sort of walk aimlessly back and forth in your apartment for two hours because of how you, how it made you feel. Yeah, I think I knew how bad this was going to make me feel because I like put off watching it until like you know like one a.m. and I was right because yeah, I felt like I felt like I swallowed like a charcoal briquette. I I, <laughs> I was just it felt so fucking bad. It felt so fucking bad for so many reasons. Uh and, and not like not in the way of like oh, he won cuz he's transportation secretary. As you'll find I think I think uh, no, we'll, no. Yeah, yeah, we'll all agree that it's like the main thing I got out of Pete watching this was like we were like afraid of this guy. We were thinking for hours every day, like, how do we stop oh, this God. juggernaut? That's, that's why I felt so yeah. bad. Because I watched this thing and I thought, how did I ever have any emotional investment in this? He's, thing? What was so what was wrong with me did, <laughs> that I had feelings of any kind of for this fucking guy? That he th- occupied a fucking fragment of my mind at any given moment. It's just like fuck. Deep indictment of you. Me. Even I know. Well, I mean, L, I know you, you, me taking yeah, you, huge L watching you, this. You even see it in the documentary that, like, as it goes on, the like Pete's eunuchs that work for him, sl- like, they slowly realize that the guy who they've like they've been gassing up this entire time, this guy that they say is going to change politics, all he is is the first paragraph on every Wikipedia article. That's all he is. He's nothing. <laughs> yep. He's Dude. got shit. He's, he's got fucking he's nothing. Got no juice. Nothing. It's, he's the, he's I wrote it down. I wrote it down in my. I wrote, I took like five pages of notes, and I said, "He's like he is the most swagless man in the world." Uh, he Evan By sold the remaining swag in Indiana in 1998. <laughs> he has less juice. There are people in fucking Dusseldorf who have way more swag than Pete Buttigieg. He's got shit. He's got God, nothing. He's ass. Fuck. You're so right about Indiana too, man. Like, look at their, the, their just look at fucking Mike Pence. He's literally mo- without moisture. He's got no juice. They're out of it. They have no juice. They have no sauce. Freddie Gibbs, like, took the last juice that was in, it was there. It was in <laughs> Gary. Because Evan Biden wasn't of even course. thinking about Gary when he sold the last swag. There was, like, an ounce of swag in Gary. And Gibbs was like, okay, I'm going to take this and I'm going to leave. Like, bye. Yeah. I'm never coming back. They experienced a uh, swag brain drain. He like yeah, Evan Bai, it was like when Chicago sold their our parking meters. Evan Bai was like, No, it's we're, we're we're selling our swag to Morgan Stanley, but we're gonna rent it back. Like and we're actually gonna have more swag. And the result is this fucking imbecile who can say hello, how are you in eight languages and claims he's a polyglot. <laughs> he's an so idiot. He can, he he can ask for the idiot. bathroom on four continents. So I mean uh not only did I have like a a similar sinking feeling watching this movie of like, holy fuck, how did anyone think that this dude was ever going to be president or like a conceivable uh, a threat to anything? I mean, he is a threat to anything. He's Just like a, a fucking a road compreh- apple. Com- comprehensively, one of the most empty automatons I've ever seen. And 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 Felix, you mentioned that his automaton slowly realized like he doesn't believe in anything, stand for anything, or just there's nothing there. To me, the most harrowing part of this movie was watching Chasen realize that. Oh God, yeah. It, that Save that, that, that left me with like the really sickest feeling was the parts with because him and like Jason. he's locked in like, there with I him. Like, like we get to go home. Me- remember we did that that New York Times article about how Chasen is adjusting to life, or rather not adjusting to life in Washington yeah. D.C. Just like. Add this in the free Chasten file because holy shit! I mean, oh. against my better judgment, I really feel bad for this guy. I feel really oh no, bad I have full sympathy for Chasten. Yeah. I mean, he's corny. Yeah, he is corny. He, he he's a herb. I probably wouldn't want to hang out with him, but he seems like genuinely a decent person. He seems like a sweet, like lame guy. He seems yeah. like he seems like like what Chasten should be. Chasten should be like. The type of guy he should be married to is like one of the men who lives in Stars Hollow and Gilmore. Girls. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> he, he should, should be, be Taylor, Taylor Dosey's Dosey. secret Dosey. husband. Yeah, 
or Kirk. Yes. Actually, I think he'd be happier with Kirk. He would. Yeah, he would be like he would be like Kirk. I like think your body is sexy. Like I like how you're <laughs> unique. Like because he's a sweet man. He's like a sweet yeah. little. It's like, like the only way to hate butter. him is if you're just are totally internet poisoned and anyone wholesome or like cringy or chuggy is worse than being a Nazi. You know. <laughs> He's and, he's a nice he's a fine guy and he did not he does not deserve this. No. No. He's no. he's he's the I would say he's the most kidnapped man alive. <laughs> I got big I got a big like sort of Johnny Gosh vibes from their whole yes. relationship. It was it's strange. Look, let's just get into the movie. I'll I'll save the Kamala article for for the end cuz I think people want to hear about about this film. But like for me like it, the the chase parts were like among the queasiest. It made me feel really bad. But like I will say that like to, to the end that like Jason does seem like a a, a fairly corny but still sincere like a, a decent person and particularly like the aspects of Jason on the campaign trail or Jason with Pete where it just seems like in a corny way like Jason does seem to be uh, to to care a lot about and like it means a lot to him personally the uh, the thought of like young LGBT people in this country like their experiences of coming out and their feelings of like what it would mean to have an openly gay man run for president or like speak yeah. speak for them like he seemed very like uh, emotionally connected to the experience of you know growing up as a gay teenager in you know parts of this country where that's maybe like not the still like accepted or it can still be a very difficult thing Pete evinces none of that and there are so many parts where chasen is trying to get him to like come out of his shell and talk more about his experience and pete plays it off like oh, it doesn't come naturally for me to to talk about my feelings you know the more private of a feeling it is like the, the more powerful it becomes but like pete just has <laughs> just chasen trying to get like to, to ring the same kind of like um the same sort of care and depth of feeling that he has regarding like uh the experience of being gay in america out of pete was so painful to watch. I, I think the best, uh, like, the thing that epitomized, like, early on, they really, like, people said this documentary is, like, bad and hollow, but I actually think it's, like, I think the documentary makers kind of knew what they were doing here. I think they they still, like, followed the assignment of, like, hey, make a, make a documentary about this really inspiring guy, but the editing in here is yeah. very, yeah. yeah, someone in here is a, a fellow traveler, at least, because... It's gotta be. Yeah, there, there's a scene early on where Jason is talking about, it's like in the first two minutes of it, where he's like, yeah, Pete's really good at talking to people and relating to people. <laughs> and the scene immediately that it cuts into is Pete talking to an old woman in South Bend and saying, oh, is that a dinner table? I love dinner tables. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the other scene. And also, there's one way that this portrait could be sympathetic. There's one way that the Pete Buttigieg we see struggling to simulate human feeling uh in this movie could be maybe uh mind for pathos instead of horror is if the narrative that you were going with while watching it is this guy he has this stuff he wants to do for people he has this vision for politics making things better but to do it he has to try to uh evince an emotionalism and like a charisma that he doesn't have and like the gap there would be sort of the tragic element of the story but there is not a single frame of this movie that talks about anything he plans to do about anything. Like there's nothing about policy at all. And like that is a choice by the editors and by the filmmakers. Like either they're totally uh, totally lobotomized by capitalism to the point where they don't think there's any possibilities. So of course he doesn't have, poli there's no reason to talk about policy or they're leaving this void there so that all you can watch is this guy trying to be president, even though he's not temperamentally suited to being a candidate for no reason just to do it and that's terrifying the the only like i mean you would the only hint that you get of anything that he actually wants to accomplish as president or on the campaign trail is to include people in conversations yeah that's yes. basically the only thing that he shows any interest in accomplishing or doing it's, yep. it's stunning yep he's got no, like absolutely no sauce no vision uh, no, no, it didn't even seem like he was even that driven or ambitious nope. to like, the whole office. No, nope. like he did not seem like he was one of like like a, as I assumed he would be, or like from my impressions of him, like here before this documentary, that he is someone like psychotic, like a psychotic striver and climber. Like he he didn't even that didn't even come across at all. He didn't seem to really want to be doing, or it's not that he wanted or not wanted to do it. He just seemed so flat and like just nothing yes. the entire time. Like you can't even get at uh, like an insecurity that he wants to compensate for by public approval. 
yes. you, you can't get at anything. You you can't you can't just get on ego. You you can't just get on no. on because there's not a lot of like a uh, flashy displays of of narcissism. It's just this drive. He's the fucking just this Terminator. There's nothing interesting about him at all that comes across in this movie. Yeah. If you like him or hate yeah. him. He is absolute void yeah. at the center of it, and it's terrifying. Well, I, I don't like. Um, we'll get into it when we get to this part. But there are scenes where he's talking to people who are actually like on the end of policy and on the end, uh, on the shit end of the stick in American society. And it's like Joe when Joe w- w- was when Joe was saying uh, there are at least three genders. <laughs> When Joe was out there saying look fat, when Joe was out there like talking about when black children were touching his leg hairs, he displayed like more ambition somehow. This guy who didn't know where he was. I really think like if they were if the makers of this documentary were untethered, I would make it because a lot of this documentary, like the latter stretch of it is Bernie versus Pete a little bit. I would make this entire thing be like primarily Chasten versus Pete, but then (laughs) Pete versus Joe. Yeah. Because it's such an interesting, it's such an interesting dichotomy. Because Joe is similar. Like Joe is also like, yeah, I'm gonna do it just to do it. Yeah, yeah. But it's tied to like this life, this narrative. Like you said, like from from being the lifeguard in uh, Wilmington to you know going to Congress. This this need to be the center of attention, to have people hear his blarney, to just listen to him. Like if try to uh, you know recreate his life in Proustian reveries. Pete has nothing. There's no, he doesn't he has, like the Biden one comes thing, alive in front of people. Honestly, you could argue that he's still running because it's the only thing that gives his life narrative structure. And if he didn't have it, he would be lost in the wilderness like fucking Anthony Hopkins at the end of the father. Uh, that's it. That's it. He's he Biden talking is auto fix. Yes. It's Ulysses. Like he's just, he has to keep he going. He has to or keep talking dies. or he will die or he will lose himself like Lear in the storm. But, uh, Peter, Pete is just doing it. The one thing that this movie says about Pete Buttigieg that I think is accurate and that one can honestly say is that he is not a traditional politician. Nope. Nor is he a traditional <laughs> human being. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, let's get into the movie itself because uh, the very first shot of this movie, the very first thing you see on screen, I really did appreciate because it was a framed photo of Pete and Chasen on the cover of Time magazine. And all I could think about was the scene in The Big Lebowski where he's in The Big Lebowski's office and it's the mirror of Time person of the year on it. Yeah. And he's just looking into it. <laughs> and then Ch- it's like a, a Chasen is like the, the first thing you see is Chasen talking to the director. And like Pete is about to sit down for like the vast majority of the like sort of a, like interview portions with him that will serve as kind of the foundation for him narrating the, the documentary. And Chasen wants the director to ask him about, like, like how, how did it feel for so long to deny your authentic self? And, you know, I've seen people who are, you know, uh, what does he say? Uh, who did everything to climb the ladder without being their authentic self. And, like, he's like, do you think you could ask him that question? And it's like, he wants the director to ask him that question because, like, he's asked him that question multiple times and probably not getting anything that seems like a real answer. Yes. Yeah. And it is, it's an interesting, like, this, there's a continued harping on, like, oh, your genuine self in this movie uh, by Chasten and by people who are trying to lob softballs at Pete. And I think what the people lobbing softballs don't realize, and what Chasten realizes about an hour into the movie is, like, no, this is Pete's authentic self. Yeah. He's not hiding anything. This is just all there is. Mm-hmm. He's like a, he's like a more he's like a more well-read version of Chauncey the gardener and being there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but instead okay. of like instead of watching TV, it was like uh like reading McKinsey reports or something. Like eating spreadsheets. <laughs> no, that's what I mean. He's a literate version operas. of Chauncey. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the very first time you see Pete um, like, like, not being interviewed, but like, like a, a little taste of him, like behind the scenes, he's uh, he's sitting at a desk signing stuff, singing the "I'm Just a Bill" <laughs> song from Schoolhouse Rock, <laughs> because he's reminding himself like how laws work, because he <laughs> he forgot, he doesn't know. I don't think it's that. I think it's him trying to like. He's like, oh, I know the camera's on me. 
uh, better do something that's like sort of quirky and relatable. And then it's like Schoolhouse yeah. Rock. Is it? Wouldn't that be cute if I was signing bills, singing that funny song that we all remember? Yeah, I think that. Yeah, he, a, a classic bit of uh, of that human camouflage he likes to throw up. Maybe he is like the Barney bit. Like he's like Pete. What do you listen to? Like pump yourself up. Oh, like I've always really liked Clean Up. <laughs> Been getting into foreign music like Frere Jaca recently. <laughs> Um, an- another aspect uh, of this film that I think is worth mentioning is that the entire movie, um, absent like a couple a couple songs, well, we'll we'll get to the song at the end, which is great, but uh, the entire movie is scored with that kind of very very treacly NPR music that they play in the background of their podcasts and radio shows. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Like, the, and it really it sets a tone. Let's put it that way. I have your like. Uh, not not a single moment of him on screen feels authentic, but as we talked about, like you begin to realize over the course of the movie that it is authentic mm-hmm. and it's really unsettling. Yeah. It's really unsettling. And like for instance, like he, he he's sitting he's sitting in the chair being interviewed by the director, and he's like, you know, I, I chose to do this, you know, like not because I was gonna like any great man of history or that I would just sort of you know part the seas and have history be shaped around me. But and then I don't know what he says after that, but it's just it's very very weird telling moment by Pete. And it's like the whole the whole point of the movie is like, can an introvert really be president? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's way more about that it, it, than any other like group. Yeah, like I mean, like that is way more essential to his like, identity that come across in this movie than being gay. Yeah. It's, it's like can an can an in J become president? <laughs> introvert is really like, I would say, the absolute most generous way you could describe him. <laughs> it, it's like like introvert implies that there is something hidden in yeah. There. That he's showing you a facade. He's like a dead... No, he's a dead plug. He's a dead electrical outlet. Yeah, he's all shell, no egg. Like, there's there's like a frequency that, like, when people interact with each other, like, they hit, you know? He's not giving it off. It's just not there at all. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, um, there, there's nothing there with, with Pete, and you feel bad for Chasen, but I would like to talk about the true star of this documentary, and that is one absolute baddie i'm talking about liz smith mm. liz she's smith a bit is of the a star of this documentary she's kind of a firecracker she, I love her. i'd say she is she is the campaign game master and like she's there to just spit real talk and say things like it's about who he is as a person she's the best and she's spitting facts she's spitting campaign truths to Pete Buttigieg. she's like she cuts through all the bullshit in the room and she's like listen you could go up there and give a baller ass answer about no North Korea and no one will give a shit. She's such a badass. I wrote down in the second thing I noticed, the second thing I took in my notes was that she was like chewing through her gum. <laughs> there there you know, there's Adderall instant release, there's Adderall extended release. Liz Smith is on Adderall eternal release. <laughs> you know, she's she's booted. Yeah. It's amazing how they frame her as this absolute a fucking off the wall maverick like bomb thrower because she says the f word sometimes. Yep, and, and that's wh- it's like oh my god, she's the real life Malcolm Tucker. She just swore. Li- there is some great. There's so much great Liz shit in this movie because you really like Pete will do the exact same thing every time they focus on him like giving an answer or like giving part of his stump speech at a town hall, and three out of the four time or two out of the four times Liz will be like, that was pretty, that was pretty good. You're a fucking rock star, but you got to fucking remember that these fucking people don't understand how fucking real you are. And then one of the times she's like, Pete, you're too smart. That was too many facts. People won't fucking get how good you are. And then the fourth time, which will no different than anything else. She'll go, that was fucking perfect. I love you. uh, Felix, I was going insane because like, there's a scene where they're doing debate prep. And like they're teeing up like the the big grand slam question for him about being gay and like you know what like or sort of like what you know oh you're just a, like a white man you know like you know how how can you uh, you know how can you demand change when it's just more of the same and like you know he rattles off some answer about you know oh you know when I was serving in Afghanistan like I could still lose my job under don't ask don't tell and then Liz is like you're giving the people straight lines you're giving them straight lines their whole life is straight lines you got to get some fire in your belly. You know, they want to hear about you. They want to hear about this. You know, I think she describes him as look at this young Midwestern veteran who's kind of out there. 
<laughs> and then and then they show the real debate where that question actually happens. And the answer he gives on stage is I virtually identical to the one he gave in debate prep. And you see her in the back in the spin room watching it, and she's doing the Nicholson nod. Like, yes, yes, Pete's killing it right now. And it was just like I, I don't understand. And then like the other the other really funny part about her job is like she is the master of earned media. And that's another interesting thing this movie shows yeah. is just just how important earned media is for the success or not of a candidate and like they didn't earn all of it they gave some money to some dude in nigeria i will go to my grave (laughs) insisting yeah yeah no (laughs) fuck yeah they should have talked to him for the like the only person who could have like pitched uh pete as a human would have been that guy yeah so my favorite my favorite scene with liz smith is keep in mind in the context of a police shooting where a black man was killed in the streets of south bend uh, Liz Smith is breaking down the media hits for him and he, she, she breaks the bad news to Pete that she goes Megan McCain who's a big fan of yours said you looked lost out there and Joy Behar another big fan said you didn't seem prepared and she's just giving them the rundown on what happened on The View that morning yeah can we talk about the sh- town hall after the shooting a yes, little bit yes because that is that is when I started that is w- when I got a stomach ache um so the way this do- like the way that like Liz Smith and like Pete and Pete's eunuchs talk about it, like right when this storyline of the documentary, the shooting in South Bend first happens, it's sort of they're it's like almost like they're trying to make it seem like the police and the man who was killed conspired to ruin Pete's life. Like, how could this happen to Pete? And this was right when he was preparing for the first debate. Yeah. So Pete goes to a town hall and everyone like all these black residents of South Bend are like rightfully yelling at him and being like, like, what the fuck are you going to do? Like what, like, like this has been going on forever. Nothing's changing. Like what, what, what do you, what are you actually proposing? And Pete, I wrote this down because it's so insane. It shows him as just having nothing. He said, he sees all this. He sees these people like crying and yelling and he goes, this is the beginning of the conversation, not the end. I believe in the city. Thank you for coming. Okay, ben, and then that that is what I realized what Democrats meant when they said George Floyd is on the ballot. They meant that every time that a black person is killed by police, that uh, one Democratic mayor will hold a town hall with it where they get yelled at and will pretend to cry like Pete does at the press scrum after Pete was the blueprint. I got to I got to shout out um, Ben Mora from Seeking Derangements because he pointed this out about this very scene in the documentary that would seem very fishy to me. And it's the part where Pete is saying. It's like, okay, he, he got a couple of very angry questions from the black residents of South Bend. And he, gave, he gives this absolute pablum, in, just absolute drivel about this is the beginning of the conversation, not the end. And I'm here to hear your voices because this community matters so much to me. And the camera focuses on Pete and then he's like, thanks, bye. And then there's this like smattering of applause and wooting that really seemed like it was edited in. You You want our votes, which I doubt you're going to get it. Do your job just so you can have a moral compass when you leave this place, dog. Because right now, the streets is crazy, man. This is the beginning of the conversation, not the end. And I need everyone to participate and stay involved so you can decide whether or not you believe in me. But I believe in this city. I believe in you, and this is part of it. And we'll keep it up. And I thank everyone for caring enough to be part of this. And I thank everyone for believing that there's a way forward in our community because this is our home. So thank you. How do you think this is going to Because they did not show the crowd reacting to him. You just saw his face and you, you heard what I think is maybe dubbed applause to make it seem like he didn't shuffle out of that fucking town hall to crickets or booze. Because it would have been, because it's like, he just had these people like like really angry pouring their heart out and he was just like gave some gave some answer where he's just like we'll continue to talk about this and I care very much bye he went back to his home planet and then there's just like this weird moment of like canned applause I mean it could be real but I when Ben pointed that out to me and I saw it in the movie it seemed very much like a little bit of journalistic sleight of hand or documentary fakery I would think that if you shazammed that applause uh, it would you would originally find it. It was used in 1998 for a talk show called the Jimmy Fallon of Malaysia. <laughs> You'll hear if you isolate that audio, you will hear people at Pete's supposed town hall, the supposed ovation he got yelling um, in Malay. And 
uh, someone else has pointed this out about this documentary, but the way they deal with this police shooting and Pete's just general, like his record uh, as mayor of South Bend as it relates to the black population of his city, it, it seemed like they were like only focusing on this police shooting as like that was the incident that like, you know, he dealt with um, gracefully and not the whole secondary issue about how the black police chief was like fucking like fired from his job for trying to blow the whistle on a lot of the shit that was going on in the police department under Pete's watch. It seemed like they were like like a retconning of like that was his racial issue on the campaign and not a bunch of other stuff that he dealt with even less satisfactorily than this police shooting. Yeah, but it gives them that. I think a lot of it is based on what footage there is. And that town hall is is robust with drama. You know, everything else is just sort of a headline. Um, OK, can we talk about the can we talk about the scene, the date night scene between him and Jason? Because that's when I really started to feel nauseous. Mm. Is they're at like uh, I don't know like Dairy Queen or something. Yeah, they're at Dairy Queen. They're at the DQ, and they're eating their little cups of ice cream. And Jason goes, "Can we eat the ice cream before dinner?" And Pete goes, "It's date night. You can do whatever you want." And then they just like sit across a four mica table, staring at each other. Yeah, <laughs> just sort of moving a blizzard around a cup. That is when um, Matt. I think you said that Pete is Don and Jason is Betty. Yeah. That's when it that really hit me. But it's like, man, Don had swag. Oh, Amber said that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, Amber said it. Yeah. yeah. Don had swag like Pete's version. Like Don is like he's a cipher because he's like, yeah, he stole someone's identity and he had this fucked up life. Pete just sucks. <laughs> like in Pete's version, Pete couldn't even do the carousel. Pete's version of the carousel is like reading the Wikipedia summary for the article on on Afro pessimism to an autistic child at a UN event. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes 12 people in the world cry. And they're all they're all journalists. Yeah, well, that's just it. Is that we watch this and one of the big questions that comes up is how did this absolute zero briefly be be one of the real top contenders for the Democratic nomination in the polls uh, and in everything. And it's because of the fucking media, because this guy's like clear reptilian hollowness is least perceptible to the people who are most influential in determining the narrative of who runs for president. That is how fucked it is. We've got a situation where the people who basically have no lizard detectors are in charge of determining political narratives while everybody else is interacting with the real world. And most of them see Pete Buttigieg and see him as this hollow bullshit artist. Unless you're a journalist or the, the civilians, the non-journalists who are most like journalists, fucking early state primary voters, fucking Iowa and fucking New Hampshire voters who basically all spend the entire presidential race acting like journalists and consuming about as much media about the fucking race as journalists produce. Just they're just guppies, just just like fucking blue whales eating tons of krill. And they just they see him through journalist eyes, through the meritocratic eyes where having the resume and saying the words and going through the motions is all that you need to do. Terrifying. Uh, there, there was another scene where, uh, you know, like uh, Liz Smith says of Pete Buttigieg, in particular, like his answers about, you know, being a gay man. She says he sounds like a tin man up there. She says he sounds like the fucking tin man up there. And then she's really happy with his answer like later, which sounded identical to what he was saying in the debate. Prep. But there's a moment where he talks on stage about how when he was a kid, he would have done anything to not be gay. Mm -hmm. Or if there was a pill he could have taken, you know, no, I would have says... taken it. He says one of the most insane things I've ever heard. He says the pill thing, but he's like, if there was a knife that could cut out the gay part of my soul, I would have used it. But thank God that we don't have that knife. Like, that yeah. there's a possibility of that knife being made. <laughs> yeah. Like, so like when P was in the CIA. Yeah, he's yeah. like, thank God the, uh, the research had not gotten to the critical point uh, when I was a teenager. <laughs> Yeah, like when Pete was, Pete was in the CIA, they are like, hey, we have this like knife that only cuts out the gay part of you. It's like a neutron bomb. And I'm like, and, and this is also like, I, I forget if it's the same context, but like he talks about how he's like, when he came home from Afghanistan, from his, I need to underscore, three month tour of duty in an office in Afghanistan. He says, I realize that I have only one life to live and that I better start living it. Meaning that like he came out of the closet when he was 33 years old. And I like, and then I don't know, married Chasen not too long after that. 
And then Chasen says, like, to the comment about, oh, if I, I would do any, I would have done anything not to be gay as a teenager, which is like, you know, I, I mean, I'm not saying that that's like, a, like an inauthentic thing for someone to feel, especially like, you know, growing up in a place where being gay is like not accepted. But Chasen seems sort of hurt by that comment. And he asked Pete, he was like, you know, he was like, sort of like, did you really mean that? Or like, did you want to commit suicide? Which is like, you know, it's a, it's a very profound like question. And I'm sure it's one that like a lot of gay teenagers have felt in this country. And Pete gives him absolutely nothing. Pete just stares at him blankly like he doesn't register it. And it's just very yeah. strange because I really I really felt in this movie that like whatever Pete's experience of being gay and coming out of the closet was in America is categorically different than Chasen's and like most every other gay person who goes through that. I mean, that's, that, that's just how I, that's the feeling I got watching it. Like there's something that's not... The, the, the clicking between the two of them were like uh, the, 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 this the, the, their experience of identity is like categorically different from each other's what 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 would you say the point is where chasten realizes that like oh my like oh my god I've okay been kidnapped <laughs> it's the scene it's the scene it's the iowa caucus night when they're watching tv and they're watching the other candidates give their speeches and chasten remarks to him yep you're the only candidate whose spouse wasn't on stage. And, and Pete just goes, Ooh, yeah. Pete goes, yeah, yeah, but, but, you, but you were up at the end. You came, and he yeah. says, yeah, but no, like I wasn't on stage with you giving the speech. And he was just like, yeah, we'll get you out there. Ooh. Yeah, and she goes, it goes, uh, like Jill was on stage. Uh, and he goes, well, in the back. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Iowa, Iowa is a great scene because A, like, yeah, Pete like kind of stole it. But like, it did not seem like a happy night. No. Uh, they were all like all 12 of Pete's eunuchs were packed into a uh, double tree with Pete and Chasten. Two of these imbeciles are throwing a Nerf football back and forth over the o over the distance of five feet. And there is, yeah, that stultifying everyone else's spouses are up there, uh, including I want to remind you, Joe, who was uh, was termed a non-viable fetus like an hour into votes County. <laughs> like joe like <laughs> that shit man joe like do you remember does anyone remember how bad joe fucking tanked and new hampshire you know, too. oh my god and no, the, you know, finished it, fifth in new hampshire okay, like mm -hmm. uh, there's a pete there's a point where pete is talking about the iowa caucus and he says like they always say there's three ways out of iowa as a candidate you win you finish close or you exceed expectations but those are the only ways yeah. out of iowa not for Joe Biden. Not Sometimes for Joe. The only way out is through the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, there's there's another really like really painful moment with Pete and Jason, and like similar to what we were talking about earlier, and they're talking about um, trying to be parents and the possibility of having kids kids together and starting a family. And Pete says to Jason, "I think about parenting, or when I think about being a parent, I think about it almost completely through you." <laughs> it was yeah he's just sort of like yeah like when i imagine myself as a father i i think about you having like you just play, doing that role or like I, he, he did yeah, not exactly. seem very like enthusiastic about the idea of starting a he family was essentially with admitting that that he was only going to have a kid because chasten wants one. yeah that's that's pretty clear that he's telling it it's like if you were not here saying we need to have a kid i would not be having one. yeah <laughs> and do you remember the scene? Uh, do you remember the scene with uh, where where uh, before the Iowa caucus, where Pete and Joe meet and have a little little meet, have a little little dance with each other? Oh God, yes, <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> and it's like once again, right before that, they show Biden supporters like like firefighter like firefighters for Biden like pushing some Pete supporter and like roughing them up. And I was like, God, no wonder he won. But uh, yeah, Joe, <laughs> yeah, the the Joe diehards that like the. 7% of people who were rocking with him. The Joe Sadukar. The Joe Sadukar are all, I love them. That they were like, every, oh yeah, they've got more got man than any of the other fucking cream puffs that they had on the, on the nerd campaigns. Imagine beating the shit out of someone for Joe Biden. Just, they That's just, awesome. they just, they just like dive into a, a formation of Pete supporters doing the high, high hopes dance with truncheons. <laughs> yeah. What, yeah. What ha what happened? Why are why are you in that crutch? Oh, um, these uh these sixty three year old men who were supporting Joe Biden in New Hampshire formed a Macedonian phalanx <laughs> and ran me through. <laughs> they all they were all wearing letter jackets. <laughs> How has your dad been taking the divorce? Not well. He became a tercio for Biden. <laughs> The, my dad shot my dad shot a graphic designer with a fucking Arboost pistol. 
<laughs> they're doing uh, at, at the uh, at the Joe Iowa headquarters. They're doing the throat singing, but instead of like all those bodies being drained into a ritual pit, they're just pouring Miller High Life into a big bucket, passing that around, <laughs> having a sip before getting out on the trail. <laughs> Joe, Joe, watching his war, his sixty-three-year-old like perfect square firefighter warrior is doing like the Delaware haka for him. <laughs> Oh that's that's who the that's who the documentary should have been about. Oh like, God, what, yes. <laughs> like, what's your deal if you were like when everyone was like, not just like Joe, you should drop out, but like J- Joe, you should kill yourself. Yeah, <laughs> like, I remember like, we were we asked that question ourselves when we were on the campaign trail and interacting with these th- people. We're like, what drives you if you're a Biden stand? I remember we went to the Biden headquarters in Des Moines, and it was just these like angry looking old people. Like when we showed up, I thought one of them was going to get a fucking uh, a double barrel shotgun and chase us off their porch. Yeah, but they wanted it. Dude, they wanted it so much more than the beat people. Yep. Oh, my God. Did they want it more? The, the beat people showed. wanted to be on fucking TikTok doing that stupid dance. Yeah. And the Joe support, the Joe supporters just want like they will die for heavier cars, more relaxing TV, milkshakes. <laughs> yep. They're They're fucking awesome. Like yeah. Joe should, Joe should have black shirts, and it should be these guys. Absolutely, these guys would have washed anyone at Charlottesville. Oh God, no question. Those pencil neck geeks. Yeah, no. The the Joe black shirts would have fucking ran the tables. Uh, two other very funny Pete on the campaign trail moments from Iowa is like there. It's at the same event. He's doing he's doing the uh, the handshake line, and uh, this woman like asks him. She's like, um. She she says, you know, uh, my brother died of a drug overdose, and now I am, you know, uh, the guardian of his children, and I'm raising them. And I just like I, I want to like like you know like w- w- where do you stand on like uh, like issues related to addiction and like our and, and she, you know, it's like obviously like you know this is someone with a very like you know tragic touching story, and he just goes check our campaign website. We have a whole <laughs> we have a whole thing about mental health and addiction. Thank you for your story. <sighs> And then a girl comes up to him and thanks him because she says, um, I came out as autistic thanks to you. And then she was just sort of like, it was like his coming out story. She was like, I came out as autistic and that's hard. And he was like, again, thank you for your story. I think she was like trying to give him a hint. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> you know, I, I came out as autistic, Pete, and I, I, I'm glad I did. You got something to say? <laughs> I, um... I, I just want to note that um, there's a lot of David Axelrod later on in this movie because Axelrod, uh, who is sort of o- first uh, Obama's first one for the presidency, he was the Karl Rove figure. He was the um, hand of the king. Yeah. He was yeah. Obama's most loyal band. And in this movie, he's basically he was, yeah. a Greek chorus. Like he, yeah. Sing, yeah. he sings the well, fortunes of Pete as they go up and down. Yeah. And he's um, he's friends with Pete. And he says at one point um, in, in sort of like the last third of the movie, you know, um, Pete isn't really someone who emotes, <laughs> which is an amazing thing to say. Like, that is like, think about saying that about your friend and you just don't chew on that at all. Oh, that's weird. He doesn't really he doesn't really do the thing that human beings are known for. That's just something about him. <laughs> like, what? What, man? Uh, just a, a couple th- a couple things of note about the the Iowa caucus because this was like you know big flashback times for me watching this part of the fucking movie, but uh, you remember the scene with uh, him and Biden where like they beat oh, each yeah. other and Biden chopping it up at him, the barbecue. He's just Ooh. he's just giving him the glad hand or whatever. And Pete says to Biden, he goes, he's like, yeah, he's like, you know, he's like Joe, he's like, uh, I I think no matter the outcome, our you know our our our, our party's in good hands. I think I think we have a pretty hand strong hand to play here, which is something you say to your opponent when you're beating them. And then yeah. Joe just goes, that's great. I'll see you, pal. And smiles and walks away. It was just like really kind of like, I don't know. It, it speaks to me that, that Joe knew what was up before any of us did. Yeah. And then he, also he was the like, scene. It was adorable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You guys yeah, have yeah, fun no. here in these early states with their six delegates apiece. While I'm sitting on a fucking giant stash of Southern delegates that you cannot get anywhere near. Have fun. Dude. J- Joe, oh my God, Joe is like Joe is just like his impishness in this scene. <laughs> the the Maltese egg painting is nothing next to the Irish trickery that Joe is about to display. What a great little yeah, scene! Yeah, if you if you didn't know anything about the pres the, that primary and you just showed someone that clip and asked who won, they'd be able to tell yeah. you. 
Oh um, my. And it's like Pete, like I remember saying that like in 2019, I was like, Joe is going to like, I was like, I don't know if I was, I was early in saying Joe is going to win. And then of course, like everyone else, I, I you was were, like, yeah. Oh my God. Does he know where he is? <laughs> but like, I did yeah. say, I said fifth place yeah. in New Hampshire. I'm sorry. It's just I amazing. I said that like Joe was going to destroy like Pete thinks he's good at what Joe is actually good at. And Joe is going to end up destroying right. him. And people would be like, like, you know, later and later in 2020, like, oh, what the fuck are you talking about? And it's like, no, that's what Joe is born to do. Pete wet read Wikipedia articles. He did not. He was yeah. Joe was really outside, dude. Joe was really at Costco. Yeah. You said you said that how like the only thing that that uh, Pete proposes as like a value add is that he's going to tell people stories or whatever yeah. the fuck or hear their stories. You're going to fucking tell people stories better than Joe Biden. And like Pete, they're like, oh, Pete has such an amazing story. Wait, you mean a more amazing story than the man who lost everything like four times in his <laughs> life? Yeah. Um. Yeah. What it comes down to is Buttigieg is industry. Biden is in the streets. I mean, like that's yeah. You, you, like the contrast is their yep. policy. Yeah, it's like, oh, oh, really? You, you you went to a you went you took a semester abroad to Afghanistan. That's cute. My family got decapitated the day before I fucking got inaugurated into the Senate. Oh wow, your dad was a professor, so you speak all these languages. Yeah, my dad was the only white union man on the East Coast in the 1950s who like was broke. <laughs> he was he's the single man disproving the book settlers. <laughs> My dad's the biggest loser in the history of the white working class. It's true. Gold he, had, era. he had, it, it's actually fascinating. So his dad married up. He married into a, uh, a, 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 a lace curtain Irish family. Uh, and he ended up glomming onto like one of the rich uncles, but he picked the most like feckless dipshit amongst them who just completely failed to bring him along on his coattails. And then he had to go to Delaware and sell cars. Like, how do you fucking fuck that up? Like the best time in ever for a yeah. guy like him. And he's like, oh, sorry, we have to like move states. We have to move to fucking Delaware because I spent all the baloney money. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Joe, dude. That's Joe. And that's why, you know, we're going to get into a little of the future of the Democrats and the future of the presidency. I really think, and I, I have, I've said this to people in my life, no one in the world is more equipped to be the president who everyone hates than Joe Biden. He is there to absorb. He is the sin eater for the dying yeah. American empire. People don't like, dude, when Mitt Romney was running for president, everyone like half of people were like, fuck you. Yeah. You know, you're the fucking bank capital guy. You could tell it ate at him because he's not, he's never lost. Yeah. He's not a loser. Joe's a fucking, if anyone can handle not just like the, not just the nose of their plane, like skimming the water a little bit, but fully crashing and hitting the bottom yep. of the sea. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. It's like they're just like th they're hitting 35% approval rating and just standing pat. Can you imagine what any of Joe's these fucking uh, live nerve ending dipshits would be doing if the, if their fucking administration was in this position, they would, they would be like the vice presidency right now they would be like kamala harris well we'll, we'll get into kamala in a little bit but like just just two two more quick things from the iowa part of this movie that i want to take note of one is the scene where they're waiting for results to come in and they're all yeah they're throwing the nerf football around and the Unix are like they're looking at their phones all panicked because they're like oh like the results aren't coming in there's a technical massive technical difficulties all i'll say is that in that scene liz smith seemed pretty calm and not surprised what was going on. <laughs> yep Mm. Oh, very, and, okay. very interesting. Uh, point number two, and you guys can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I, I want to know how you guys remember it. This movie made it seem like Bernie Sanders spoke before Pete Buttigieg that night. Do you guys remember yes, that they, in the they, documentary? They completely, completely, they completely retconned it. They completely retconned it. They Pete show Buttigieg. Bernie speaking, and then Pete's like, "You think we should get out there and say something?" They make it so. They make it so Pete doesn't announce victory in Iowa until days later when he technically has more SDEs. And it's that is not what happened. That nope. is Pete declared victory at like 8 p.m. Yeah, they definitely yeah, fudged they, that time. I was there. We were to, there. To, they don't want <laughs> yeah. to emphasize that. Although they do have the thing where where Bernie goes on the plane the next day for someone to declare victory without an official tally. I think uh, that is wrong. But they did not give you the impression in this narrative that that's what happened. Um, and it's just like, as the movie goes on, it, it becomes like um, among Chasen and the people around him, it becomes this question of like, there, there, there's two questions. It's like, one, how do we use being gay 
as the answer to the political problem of being a white man running for president in 2020. And I don't think they come up with a satisfactory answer. But then there's another very telling moment where uh, Chasen says, like, either rhetorically or, or to Pete, I think he says to the camera, to the director being interviewed, he says, what's the difference between the face the world makes you show and your shifting understanding of yourself? And it's like the, the, these very, mm. like, like very, very disturbing realizations about, like, identity and or lack thereof. With, 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 this, with him as a candidate and with him as a human being, with him as a man, just in general, a spouse, a lover, a friend, a husband, a father. And it, it just, it, it leaves you with a very queasy feeling. And then you yeah. realize, you realize that like what you're seeing of Pete on the campaign trail and the way he talks to the media, the way he talks to angry constituents, the way he uh, t- talks to the people on his campaign, he talks to Chasen in the exact same way. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, perfect. And yeah. Do you guys, are, do you remember the scene, and this, this is probably like the most, upsetting part of the movie do you remember the scene where like they're 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 sitting at a diner and chasen's head is on the table and they're just like pete sits across from him and just silently starts eating a pastry or something yeah. and then chasen does this little thing where he his head is like on the on the table and then he sticks his finger out and starts wiggling it and then pete just does a little finger game with him on the table it was like this moment of like supposed to be like authentic uh, you know intimacy between a couple this sort of this keyhole glimpse behind the curtain but the whole thing seems so fucking stilted and fucking awkward and like i, I think there's a photo of them kissing but like is there any scene in this movie where yeah, they kiss yes, each they other kiss behind, backstage towards the end of the movie uh, it, it honestly kind of okay. looks like pete scrunches his face up a little bit before the lips hit just because like he's like he's, he's doing the josh hallway like he's wincing thing. or something yeah it's not it is incredibly stiff Pete and Josh Hallway should run again. They should get the, married. I mean, everyone says like they should yeah, do a dynastic marriage guy. that gets rid of uh, our two party system once and for all. Fuck the thirty k voter election. That is the five k voter yeah. election. <laughs> just have just have oh them God. be sealed, like like the like the Betty Jesuit wanted to do. Bring House Harkonnen and Tra- and Traides together. If Pete and Josh Hallway docked. You would create the most swagless entity that has ever existed. <laughs> a, a human black hole. A hollow man. Yeah. I mean, they're it, both it, people it, that joined the military for their fucking resume. So, I mean, just imagine what that Saiyan fusion dance would, would the, the, the fucking, the, the brain power that that would fucking uh, produce. Wait, I think you're getting it mixed up with um, Tom Cotton. Didn't Josh Hallway didn't go, They the both went to uh, Ivy League schools, but I don't think Hallway went to oh, okay, university. Yeah. Hallway wasn't a military guy. Okay. Yeah, Tom Cotton did the Pete where he like he went a little bit. That's the difference between like a Democrat yeah. Tom and a Cotton actually does killed it. people. No, Tom Cotton he didn't. Tom Cotton like got them to give him like a combat badge and like a like he he has bullshit. Medals. You know we we oh really? So he he just yeah. seems like a psychopath. No, yeah. he's a psychopath. Okay. He's just one who never bothered going and killing people to get it out basically like he's like Mayor Pete in that way. Really, it's Cotton and Pete who are the true yeah. mirrors of each other. Like those guys but are like, the same but guy. Like, Tom Cotton's medals are like they're like a Lyndon Johnson's medals situation, from what I understand. But like again, it's like it shows how unimpressive Pete is because like Cotton did win a statewide election, something Pete has never yeah. done ever. Oh man, there's another scene where uh, uh, P- Pete is about to he's about to go out there and declare victory a second time in the Iowa caucus. And Ch- I'm like, you know, he's, he's getting out there and Chasen is like sort of dropping a hint to him. And he's going, do you think you could do you think you could say something or could you speak to a gay kid out there who like doesn't believe this is possible? And then could, could you speak to like their experience about like what this means for them and you tonight? And Pete just goes, maybe they should call this movie. It never gets better. <laughs> So, like, I mean, honestly, like, not much happens in this movie after Iowa because there's it's nothing just, to boo! show. It's just, yeah, it's like, fucking and the, uh, the only, the only possibly illuminating for the historical record or for Pete as a person, the only illuminating thing that this documentary could actually portray is the Obama phone call when he dropped yeah. out. But they retcon that shit, too, and show a second Obama phone call where Obama's just like, oh, you did good, Pete. And this is after he's dropped out. They make it seem like Obama called him then and talked to him. And it, the I wanted to see the Obama phone call because it's like Obama is like the Michael Jordan of the Pete Hollow shit. Like Obama's actually amazing at the shit that like Pete's imbeciles think that Pete is good at. O- Obama is putting on that human suit. 
he put it on better than anyone else. He was really the man at that of just saying bullshit and people going crazy for it. That is that is Jordan playing a pickup game against like a a pretty good eighth grader. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, like uh, not much more happens in the movie, and then like there's a scene where you know where Pete drops out, and he's like, "Well, that's how you end a presidential campaign." You know, he's like, "We just looked at the numbers, and it it just wasn't there." I mean, again. A, a complete travesty of the historical record, given what we all know actually transpired. I mean, he had no reason to drop out before Super Tuesday. But even if he but did, his justification is, uh, yeah. you know, we got a crowded field. Got to, got to. If there's a crowded field, you have to get out. You know, you got to unclutter it. It's like why? Well, he does. I he does say one thing. He he does let one thing slip when he goes. Um, well, I mean, it, it's a credit field, but we can actually yeah. help. Yeah, exactly. We can yep. do we something. Can, yep. Which is like, yeah, we can stop burning. Yeah, that's the unspoken assumption there. So, and, and then when he's like, well, that's how you end a presidential campaign, then the movie drops what I think is the best um, song choice. Because we've already heard High High Hopes, but th th those are all uh, diegetic to the, the film. Yeah. The, 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 the non-diegetic music after Pete officially drops out and hangs up the phone is Perfect Day by Lou Reed. <laughs> and the, the climax of the movie is like a montage of him like saying goodbye to everyone over Lou Reed's Perfect Day, which is... I just started like, what's the, the Pete Buttigieg version of Perfect Day? is like, we, uh, we shot animals at the zoo. <laughs> and later on, some Netflix too. It's such a perfect day. I'm glad I spent it with Pete. You just keep me hanging on. Do, 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 um, But the, yeah. The, during, during the perfect day scene, I um I expected to see like an end of casino montage where everyone who isn't Pete, uh, who isn't uh, Liz Smith or that ginger guy who the interview is killed. <laughs> just gets where shot. Pete's like, all right, I have no use for you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> where are you going, Jack yeah. off? <laughs> 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 That's his dog. <laughs> some, fat, some fat guy is his dog he's not one of Nicholas. us yeah his dog fled to Costa Rica <laughs> but you know his puppy got arrested for drug dealing and then you know that hey why take a chance <laughs> God, I, 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 I want a documentary about Liz Smith she's so much more interesting than Pete Buttigieg Liz is awesome and Liz throughout the movie wears some of the worst fits of all time Liz Smith <laughs> yeah, 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 Liz yeah, Smith yeah, Liz Smith she like Liz Smith has money and she dresses like a Two episode arc villain on Freaks and Geeks. She dresses yes. like a mean teacher on Freaks and Geeks. I, I think someone pointed this out on Twitter, but there's a scene where she's wearing like a fucking Austin City Limits t shirt and she's like, I'm worried our campaign's a little too white. <laughs> <laughs> she's wearing a Guns N' Roses t shirt at one time. Oh, she's the best. She's such Liz a badass. Smith, I bet when she get when she gets off of work, she takes off the Austin City Limits t shirt and and puts on one of those like Target Mountain Vintage Mountain Dew soda T-shirts. <laughs> She's awesome. She's and fucking. That's my favorite thing in the entire movie is when any like just her what she think like how good she thinks Pete does. Just it, it's completely random. It's RNG. It's a randomly generated number. <laughs> Whether Pete like was too smart or it was fucking perfect. And oh my god, I'm crying. You're the you're the smartest. Well, I mean, I, I think that's interesting about the movie is I think it shows what these media consultant jobs really are. It's like you're you're a rainmaker. So like when when you're in the debate prep, you're like terrible. Got to do better. Got to be more personal. You're like the tin man. You're giving people straight lines. And then when the candidate gets out there on the new uh, gets out there on the real deal and in front of millions of people behaves exactly the same way, then when they get off stage you're like, "Pete, you killed it. You're the man." And like so they think that like you yeah. help them. There's just comment just sort of like thing. yeah, it's like, "Oh, and it obscures what Liz Smith's actual job is, which is like, hey, um, have Pete and Jake Tapper have a swag list <laughs> off on TV. <laughs> like that her real they can't show her real job because this is ostensibly a pro Pete documentary, even though I have I do think, you know, I do think there was some artistic choices here. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. There was a, there was a, had, there was a couple ops working on this movie. It had to be. Oh yeah. It no, there be. are some there is either uh one Chapo success daughter or 12 fail kids in the editing room. <laughs> Hard to say. And, you know, like the, uh, uh, the, the, the finale of the movie, and again, like this is the least triumphant political documenta d documentary that is clearly like an advertisement for him running for yeah. president. The fucking, like his triumph at the end of the movie is being transportation secretary. And the last scene of the movie is him and Chasen walking hand in hand, like down the National Mall at night. 
And he's just like, wow, here's our new life as a cabinet secretary in the, the lamest fucking cabinet position you can possibly have in a presidential administration. And the one that everyone now is mad at him over. <laughs> like because, because of, yeah. they're, they're they're blaming him for supply chain stuff, which and gas. I will say like a, li- like a little a little bit erroneously, but like I'm not gonna get in your way if you're doing that. I really well, don't care. Like have fun. I mean, so like that's the Pete documentary, and I think now we should transition into like where this is all leading, and like what what it, what is the sort of uh, what is the context under which this movie was released, and that is clearly the 2024 election, and the fact that we have seen like you know an article in Politico. Um, And it's just basically about how the Democrats are looking to 2024 and they're like, it's Kamala or Pete. And that's the future of our party. Ooh, we just watched. We just got exposed to like, damn, the x-ray of his soul, as he called it at one point, his campaign. He he says at one point that fucking movie says uh, many people say that campaigning is a MRI for the soul. I would like to know who has ever said that because that is some serial killer shit. (laughs) I don't know what the fuck that's supposed to be. I would to like mean. to see the results yeah, exactly. of that MRI. Is it just a fucking black uh, cell? They, they, they'd be like, are you wearing a lead outfit? <laughs> <laughs> like, this is the most swagless beta in the world. Yeah. And according so- to conventional wisdom, it is him in 2024 to replace Biden, or it is Kamala Harris. And okay. That's the option. And, and he- just... The 30K election that Felix predicting might happen sooner than we thought. I mean, well, we, it like- might go lower than 30K. After this... Yeah. Because like if you had if you had an entire summer of Pete as a presidential candidate, Ooh. people are like people are like burning their voter registration cards in the street like draft cards in 1970. Yeah. And OK, so like the, the context I want to get into is like, OK, there was there's an article last week about how like you know, the, the party's future is either Pete Buttigieg or Kamala Harris. And I want to dive into this CNN article today, which uh, relies on the. <laughs> Over a dozen anonymous sources in the vice president and president's office talking shit about Kamala that, like, clearly, given the choice between the sitting vice president and his transportation secretary, they are clearly think the transportation secretary is a better bet for them in 2024. You know what? I don't know if that's the case because I read this article and I think you could make like on its face because of the loser stink wafting off of every quote in this piece. And how it emphasizes dysfunction in the in Harris's office, and the fact that the author Isaac Devore uh, is a like Democratic Party cutout, one hundred percent. Oh yeah, it does feel like oh they put the beam on her, but that is a subtext you can read from it. But the actual article really is exculpatory. It is a bunch of people complaining that people aren't being nice enough and helping Kamala enough. Like that's the actual text and. These people are so up their own asses at this point that it wouldn't rule me out that the Democratic Party is like, oh, no, nobody likes Kamala. Well, let's complain to the press about how everyone's being mean to her. That's the Hillary. And they thought people would like that because they would like that because they they care very much about fairness. Well, and this whiner, this like this whining, this Martin Prince teacher, teacher where you forgot to assign her homework, loser whining in this fucking piece comes off as sympathetic to people in a certain lanyard class. It's only to regular people that this peers disgusting and repellent well, and loser talk. But also, I mean, the article does like, I mean, it's, it's, it's Kamala's people. It's a number of people and they're complaining that Biden is essentially handicapping her and yes, Biden is not is doing the, enough. That's the pitch here. And like, yeah. like she was chosen by Biden to be his VP. Her approval rating is lower than Biden's is right now. Yes. And they're like, they're speculating about like, they're, they're looking for ways to fucking just offload this dead weight. And Kamala is feeling like she is not being groomed for office as you would expect of someone who is the sitting vice president for a guy who is 90 years old and of dubious mental capacity. I think there's absolutely a faction of the Democratic Party that is doing that. Uh, and they're probably the ones close to Biden. Uh, but I'm still not sure if this article is their uh doing their leaks or the leaks of the pro Kamala faction because well, I honestly think it could be either maybe both at the same time not knowing uh that they're both contributing to the same project uh let's let's let's, let's suss it out here I'm just gonna read the article begins 
Uh, worn out by what they see as an entrenched dysfunction and lack of focus, key West Wing aides have largely thrown up their hands at Vice President Kamala Harris and her staff, deciding there simply isn't time to deal with them right now, especially at a moment when President Joe Biden faces quickly multiplying legislative and political concerns. The exasperation runs both ways. Interviews with nearly three dozen former and current Harris aides, administration officials, Democratic operatives, donors, and outside advisors who spoke exclusively to CNN reveal a complex reality inside the White House. Many in the vice president's circle fume that she's not being adequately prepared or positioned and instead is being sidelined. The vice president herself has told several confidants she feels constrained in what she's able to do politically. And those around her remain wary of even hinting at future political ambitions with Biden's team highly attuned to signs of disloyalty, particularly from the vice president. Um, going on here, it says, defenders and people who care for Harris are getting frantic. When they're annoyed, some pass around an onion story mocking her lack of more substantive political work. One with the headline, White House urges Kamala Harris to sit at computer all day in case emails come through. When they're how, I love how they think that that's sympathetic to her, that that article isn't making fun of her. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. When they're depressed, they bat down the Aaron Sorkin style rumor that Biden might try to replace her by nominating her to a Supreme Court vacancy. That chatter has already reached top level levels of the Biden orbit, according to one person who's heard it. And they go on to talk about how um, she really really did not want to be the point person for Biden's border policy. <laughs> yeah, no and, shit. I mean, I don't blame her <laughs> because they put her out here to say, do not come. Do not <laughs> don't come. come. Don't come. Don't come. And she correctly I'm recognizes that, that all these... That all the issues she's being given, they're like, Kamala, you're taking point on this, are the absolute dogs and losers that there's no fucking... She's going to get no fucking points for, from anyone for doing. And uh, it goes on here. It says... When Biden picked Harris as his running mate, he was essentially anointing her as the future of the Democratic Party. Now many of those close to her feel like she's, he's shirking his political duties to promote her and essentially setting her up to fail. Her fans are panicked watching her poll numbers sink even lower than Biden's, worrying that even the base Democratic vote is starting to give up on her. Kamala Harris is a leader, but is not being put in positions to lead. That doesn't make sense. We need to be thinking long term and we need to be doing what's best for the party, said a top donor to Biden and other Democrats. Imagining how to make the case directly to the president. You should be putting her in positions to succeed as opposed to putting weights on her. If you did give her the ability to step up and help her lead, it would strengthen you and strengthen the party. On the one issue Harris has asked to be assigned, voting rights, progress has been slow in part because Biden focus is focused on passing his own domestic agenda, even though Harris has said privately the filibuster must be scaled back if real progress can be achieved. Biden has said as much publicly, too. And though Harris has told confidants that she has been enjoying the good working dynamic directly with Biden, those who work for them describe their relationship in terms of settling into an exhausted stalemate. Suspicion has sprouted out of the bitterness. Last month, White House aides leapt to the defense of Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, who was being hammered with outrage by Fox News host Tucker Carlson and like-minded online pundits for taking paternity leave after the adoption of his twins in September. Harris loyalists tell CNN they see, in yet the, they see in that yet another example of an unfair standard at play, wondering why she didn't get similar cover any of the time she's been attacked by the right. Mm -hmm. It's hard tell to tell it. It's hard to miss the specific energy that the White House brings to defend a white man, knowing that Kamala Harris has spent almost a year taking a lot of the hits that the West Wing didn't want to take themselves, said a former Harris aide reflecting conversations last month among several former aides and current allies. Th that's It goes here. Uh, White House aides say they weren't pitting one against each other. Going on, it says, that's different from when Harris has created problems for herself. White House aides believe, such as when she didn't push back on a student who accused Israel of ethnic genocide. West Wing aides weren't going to clean up that up after her. But even when Harris has faced her own manufactured outrage from the right, like when an innocuous tweet about annoying the, enjoying the long Memorial Day weekend was said to be her insulting dead veterans, White House aides also remained virtually silent. I mean, I, I do have to say to Kamala, it's like, are you, are you fucking new here? <laughs> this, this, this these people gave you a husband and two stepkids. This is a, they found a fucking they found a fifty five year old Jewish man for you to have a marriage with. You did, are you new? Did you just start at the Democrats this week? Are you, your are husband you, doesn't have a belly button, Kamala? You should know how this works. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, no, it, it's. I mean, what does she expect? 
Jeez, she what did you think was going to happen in the Biden administration? It's not. It's she wants somebody to fix it for. Her. It's just it's oh, yep. it's a participation trophy culture. Let me tell you. Yeah, like she's trying so hard. It's not fair. And like you're supposed to give a shit, lady. You're vice president. You're trying to become president. We don't have your power. What are you supposed? We're supposed to feel sympathetic for you. I thought that was. I thought politics was supposed to be the other way around. I thought the politicians were supposed to sympathize with us feel our pain and all that bullshit if they couldn't do anything else now you're supposed to feel bad for politicians it's the same thing with actors yeah. it's like what you were saying about kumail and his dysmorphia it's like see yeah. the, see, see eternals to make him feel better about himself see the new ghostbuster so ivan reitman can fucking get over his daddy issues uh, yep. and then uh, vote for the democrats so kamala can feel better about being you know exactly like, yeah and the border thing is like Okay, well, you know what you would do if you wanted to be the most powerful person in the world? You would take this awful situation that you are the the, the guy who you willingly were the vice president yeah. and said, yes, I'll do this. The, the party that you have devoted your entire fucking life to, I remind you, the party that gave you a family, okay? <laughs> um you would go, wow, well, you know, this doesn't look good, but maybe I can find, I can have some rhetorical flourish that will make people <laughs> not not as mad at it. Maybe I can do that. No, it's just feel bad for me. I'm the real victim of the border because I, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the asshole they're yelling at. Yep. Jesus Christ. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I don't even, I don't even want to give this idea to the Democrats. They don't deserve it. They don't deserve any of my great ideas. Of course not. But Kamala is a loser. Pete is nothing. Yep. But you know who are neither of those things? You know who's someone who is everything, and you know who's someone who's a winner? Two currently elected Democrats. One who has won a statewide election. One who has won an election in a city that might as well be a state. <laughs> I'm talking about the super ticket, something we've never tried before. A neuroatypical black man. <laughs> and a, a large man who really isn't that smart, but is very likable. <laughs> Something we've ne Democrats have never tried. Eric Adams and J.B. Pritzker. Oh, man. There's your, I thought you were going to say Ooh. Bill de Blasio. No, Bill de Blasio, the, the, the Bill de Blasio is, he's trans, he's going to be trans. Also, you can't, unless you want to sacrifice New York's electoral votes, you can't have two people from the same state on the same ticket. Yeah, no way. No way. We, we, it's, I disagree. I think an all New York ticket would, would be a fucking, would be a blue wave election. Probably because everyone does move to New York. You know, everyone loves it. But, I just like JB. You have to balance Adams's veganism. You got to have somebody who likes to party That's and true. like eats a sausage. You got to you got to balance. Well, Eric it. Adams likes to party. Yeah, but I mean, like like uh, tailgate party, like Midwest party. Okay, yeah. You got to yeah, get yeah. those people. Like they don't know about going to the club. They know about going to the grill, and they fucking get J. They know that JB gets that. When people in Chicago say they're hungover, they literally mean they're hungover from eating too much food. Yes. Yep. That is the main thing they do. And that goes and for a whole, like that, that third coast culture that we come from. Those are all electoral votes up for grabs. And all of those people are hung over from meat. Yes. JB is like, okay. What I think is most important about JB is, you know, all Pete's idiots and Pete's fucking journalist helpers are like, oh, he's so smart. I mean, hey, he's not. No, he's no. not. He's just, he's nothing. JB, no one thinks mm -mm. JB is smart. JB doesn't think JB is smart, but that doesn't, no one, want, no, Biden won because Biden is not smart and has never been smart. And also JD had a, had, JB had a similarly endearing trans gaffe as Ooh. Biden did because Biden has, of course, the hilarious, there's at least three genders. And JB had the amazing tweet where he said to protest anti-trans bathrooms legislation, you should go into the other gender bathroom as a, <laughs> and when he said, when people met, got mad at him for that. He was like, I didn't mean it literally. Yeah. <laughs> He's and awesome. And you know what? It He's was like, okay, JP, don't worry about it. Just like with Biden. Well, because, I mean, like, like the, 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 the common denominator here is that they're not whiners. Yes. They're yep. not fucking whiners. I mean, right. Like, Kamala is a whiner and Pete is just a zero. Yep. Yeah. He's got he's got nothing going on. And, it, and, it, and it, if they run either Kamala or Pete in 2024, yep. I don't care who the Republicans put up there. If it's Trump, he may win all 50 states. <laughs> oh, God. If, it's, if it's any other Republican, yeah. it, like it's 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 it, we're, it's going to be it's terrible. Like you're it's going be, to it's see, like McGovern. You're going to see a, a an acceleration of the uh, non college educated push move towards Democrats across all de demographics. 
And even more importantly, you're going to see a continuation of the drop in voter participation among traditional Democratic constituencies. Unless it's Eric and JB. They, like, I, you're correct. Those about are your this, only guys. Way. And here's the important thing. You don't have to say like, oh, what about their positions versus vis a vis each other? This is there's no difference. This is the Democratic Party. That what there's has nothing has anything to do with policies. Those policies are set in uh, corporate boardrooms. These guys are just playing in on, in front of the camera for us. Who, so who do you want to do that? Who do you want to be the like the cork in the stopper preventing like full fascism that you're so terrified of? If you're a Democrat, this yeah, will do if it. This is. If every election is the most important election of our lives, yep. I can only think of two Democrats that people will find likable. You could say, no, Gruesome Gavin is not playing. Oh, no. No, 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 no way. No way. They love his shit, but like not. Uh, he leaves those borders. His powers are worth nothing. Gruesome Gavin, people over there, they love it when their governor goes to evil weddings. They love that he's slick. They love that he's aerodynamic. They love that he's <laughs> fucked everyone in the state. People in the rest of America, no, not so much. They see JB, a good-natured large man who inherited a fortune and is spending his dividends on ribs. They see Eric Adams, a man who lies for seemingly no reason at all. <laughs> they see themselves. That's us. That's who we are. That's America. Yep. Give us that. Adams was strongest in the primary among voters who uh, failed to turn out for Hillary and would do so yep. again in a similar condition. Eric Adams, I want to see, I'm not saying just anoint these guys. I think we need an introduction period. I would like to see Eric debate Kamala. <laughs> I think he you know would what, You know what Eric Adams did? Her. Either before he officially won the election or right after, do you know what he did? He went to Monaco. I know. He My wanted to, he went to fucking Bond Monaco. Like James fucking Bond. <laughs> He was just, just fucking, uh, just stunting in Absolutely. Monaco. He went up to the fucking. He he just he's like, I'll blow ten thousand dollars at the craps tables. Who gives a fuck? I'm. He probably New York. knowing Eric Adams, he probably went up to a blackjack table and said, "Put it all on black." And we were like, what? <laughs> the thing that you guys, the thing that needs to be reminded about 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 Adams is that this is a guy who has been trying to become mayor for like thirty years, and he has been like on a success grind mindset non-stop for that entire time he has been like but he still has fun though improving himself like eye on the on the ball uh like all that stuff to like make it up the ranks the first the police department and then state politics it's purely through grind set and it worked people thought he was a joke he, he ran would for congress in the early 90s when he was still a cop he couldn't even get on the ballot he tried to do like a write-in it was a joke He's the fucking mayor of New York. He's the only Democrat, a Democrat from New York, New York City, mind you, and Fort Lee, New Jersey. <laughs> he would win Utah. <laughs> Honestly. Because his life is an MLM. Yes, it is. JB. It, it, he's dude. the other because he hasn't gritten at all, but he's nice and jolly about it because of that. Because he hasn't had to work for it. Yeah. No bless oblige to find like a fucking like a a, a, a a stay puff marshmallow man made of no bless oblige and bononomy bonomy. It's the dude. This is this is not just a solution to Democrats problems. This is the only way you keep America going as a unified absolutely country. absolutely. Well, well, we you know we've we've just outlined a way out of this brutal death trap of either Kamala or Pete running for president in 2024. Let's see if the Democrats take our advice. Let's see what they do. Yeah, let, let's see. How, let's see how this goes. I, I, I know where I'm putting my money. That's for sure. It is going to be um, what it actually is going to be. It, Michael Bloomberg and um, uh, who who uh, Val Dennings. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be it. Yeah. And they are going to it's going to be Trump and Trump's VP. uh Pence is no, out. he's done for. Oh yeah, no yeah. way. Maybe DeSantis. I don't. Th I think Trump doesn't like. DeSantis yeah, he's too threatened he's like, by Trump. Trump is such, yeah. I, my my dream would be my pillow guy. I think it should, it should be Mike Lindell. I think Trump like would probably want to pick Lindell. I think that people in his orbit would say it's too weird, but he's not. He'll never pick DeSantis because Trump is like he thinks that he like thinks of himself like an aging starlet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very star is board deal. Yeah, he did. Yeah, all about Eve style. He sees DeSantis, who's like the one Republican with a national profile who has like any little bit of swag. Yeah. And to say, you know, I love what DeSantis does uh, where like 
once every two months um they kill everyone in florida and then they're like oh how come how come no one's talking about how our cases are lower now <laughs> after like, ten thousand people died yeah. you, you gave everyone covid like okay like yeah the vi- everyone every, every had new it. variant it burns through the population of florida like a fucking forest fire and then when and then when it's out he's just like uh funny how no one's talking about our caseload is among the lowest in the nation that is pre- that's a pretty funny move. Um, yeah, it rules. Like you know, I I do think like someone told me that um the vaccination numbers in Florida are artificially inflated because rich people from Latin America come to Florida to get vaccinated and then they count that towards their vaccination score. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> that sounds Which, right. Which it makes sense because it's like Florida always had a higher rate than I thought of, but it's like oh holy shit, they're like getting fucking It's what I don't know. I don't want to go to get too much into COVID discussion. Uh, I think that like a lot of things with the virus are m- more out of our control than we'd like them to be. Yeah. But just like, as uh, like to do the, after all those people die to be like, well, look at that. We, we beat COVID for the fifth time this year. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fun. Such a good move. Such a great move. And it works too, because it, yeah. cause, cause again, you can put the numbers on TV and you're like, oh, look, we're down. Look, yeah. we have very low. And it's just like, okay, put that next to your population. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, yeah, he's he's got the swag, but like that is specifically what Trump doesn't like about. Yeah, him. and Lindell has swag, but Lindell is like Lindell. Uh, to borrow a great a uh, great term from my favorite philosopher Richard James Bankston, uh, Faze Banks, Mike Lindell will sit on the knee for Trump. He's 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 no spring chicken. He just loves Trump. He loves what about uh Bobert as a VP? Ooh. Now you're talking. Ooh. Now you're talking. He wouldn't pick MG. Yeah. He wouldn't pick MTG because she's busted. No, no, a- Frank, MTG, she's just MTG, unattractive. Yeah. But I yeah. think Bobert. Yeah. I think he could like squint at her and be like, "Okay, come on over here." Yeah. And I don't. And, be, Bobert, and because he's a woman, I don't think he'd be threatened by her. You know, it's gonna be the funniest thing is when all those like all those guys who are like trying to like like, like a dude who's running as a, like a national conservative in Arizona, they all audition to be the VP, mm-hmm. and Trump just just breezes past them. <laughs> all those teal dudes. Yeah. Bye bye. No, he's gonna pick a star. Yeah, you're not a star, baby. I'm ready for my close up, Mr. Blitzer. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. So that was uh, the Mayor Pete documentary. Um, almost as bleak as um our political future in this country. I think no matter what things are looking up, we're either going to live in the Pritzker Adams Imperium or we're finally going to break this thing up. And you know, I mean, people uh, yes, may, yes. <laughs> and you know, people people may you know they may raise their eyebrows at us boosting JB Pritzker, or Eric Adams, but keep in mind that we're literally communist. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. No, we're literally communist. JB Pritzker would be the end of neoliberalism. Do you realize that? Yep. It it died in let's say March. It came back. It's back again. We're going to kill it again. And then when it comes back a third time, JB will end it. It's like COVID in Florida. Yes. <laughs> We've beaten neoliberalism for the seventh time this year. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that uh, that does it for today's episode on uh, Mayor Pete. Mayor Pete, we hardly knew you. Literally. Yeah. I had no I, idea. I, I really did. I really didn't know him. I did not know who he was until I saw this movie. And now the answer yeah. is nobody. <laughs> Nothing. 